I just thought it'd be too complex. And I started to learn about it as a founder, as a marketer, and as a web developer. I realized this isn't that difficult. So before I actually got into AI, I was writing a sci-fi trilogy about it. And I've always found AI just so fascinating to, uh, to think about. It's always just seemed intuitive to me in terms of the fact that it was coming and that it was going to go somewhere and it was going to affect the world in a massive way. And we're living just the beginning of that today, right now, as of this video. Um, it is going to transform the world and this is a revolution that will only come once in our lifetimes. I made some sort of uh, assumption because I thought for some reason that I just, I wouldn't be smart enough. The math would be too complex. And so I never really looked into, you know, AI in terms of like how it functioned. I just thought it would be like too complex, even though, you know, I am a self-taught, um, you know, computer science uh, engineer, web developer. I just thought it'd be too complex. And I came across a video um, a little while after finishing, actually writing that sci-fi trilogy. And I said, huh, this is actually really interesting. Let me give this a shot. But I need to like fundamentally understand like how does this actually work at a ground level? And I started to learn about it as a founder, as a marketer, and as a web developer who just didn't know anything about this, although I did know about, you know, computers and, and uh, programming. Um, but even without that, as I learned, I realized this isn't that difficult. Um, fundamentally, at a ground level, it's really simple. And that's what I want to share with you today. Uh, whether you're a founder, a marketer, or just a non-engineer in general, and you just want to understand, when I type something into some sort of a large language model, a chat bot, uh, something like Gemini or chat GPT, Claude, whatever, or whatever comes in the future or that is likely to come in the future. What is happening? Like, what is this so-called artificial intelligence? How is it actually doing what it does to generate images and play games and write text that seems like it is intelligent? So over the years, just there have been many different approaches to creating artificial intelligence. Um, for example, there was something, and there still is today, something called symbolic uh, artificial intelligence, where basically you'd have like a database of, of rules. And essentially, you know, these rules are what would help an AI to, you know, navigate and uh, rather to communicate and make decisions. Um, and a lot of these ways are still being uh, researched, but today most of the AI that you see making predictions, robotics, game playing, classification, image generation, text generation, and even video, at a basic level, it's all running on what you would call a neural network um, type of AI design. And when you hear a neural net, um, just kind of interchange that with AI, at least for today, that it's possible something will be discovered, a new architecture, a new type of processing. But neural nets have worked the best to date. Ironically or not, there are some really sim real similarities in terms of their construction compared to the human brain. Because you look at a neural net, it has layers of neurons represented as circles, and then lines between the circles or the neurons representing uh, synapses. Just like in your brain, how you have uh, neurons, and then the way that the neurons kind of communicate or send signals to each other is you have synapses connecting all of the neurons of which there are uh, many billions. And in terms of synapses, there are a lot more than neurons. In the human body and in the human brain, there are trillions of uh, synapses. And again, these signals, they, they propagate, they carry information. Like if I, you know, touch something, there is a, a signal being transmitted for me to actually sense this. And so I can be aware of it and process it and, you know, decide to do something with it or not, you know, consciously and or unconsciously. So essentially, when you think neural net, just think AI, but also a neural net is a digital brain. It's a little digital brain on a computer. Um, if it's a really big digital brain, it might be kind of distributed across multiple servers, but 
It's a digital brain on a computer. So what is happening when you actually uh, see these digital brains doing something? You know, when it's, for example, you type a question and you get a response, you know, basically one piece of a word or, and which turns into multiple words, which turns into sentences and paragraphs and blah, blah, blah. What is actually happening when that happens? When you see it, robots who are picking things up off the table, when you see, you know, a Tesla that is self-driving, you know, down the street, how is it actually doing this? How is it using vision? How is it playing games? How is it moving the cup from the left side of the table and stacking it? as I just saw an interesting demo of yesterday. What is happening at a ground level is simple math, like very simple math that's easy to understand, um, but we don't actually understand at the same time. Let me explain. So basically think of like the digital brain as you have an input layer, that's like where sensory data, like for the external environment or the, you know, the game environment that it's playing in, or in the case of a large language model like ChatGPT or, or Gemini or others, basically words are turned into some sort of numbers. Those are fed into the input of this little digital brain. And then there are a bunch of neurons in between. And then there's an output layer of neurons, which then those numbers that it outputs are translated back into words. And the math that allows the signal, if you will, which again is really just, you know, words at first turned into numerical data, numbers, and for the signal to propagate through the brain to basically be processed and for thought to actually happen, and ultimately for it to give it given intelligent seeming output, uh, basically what is happening is uh, addition and multiplication and a fancy term that isn't that fancy once you understand it called an activation function all right and that is most of what is is happening today in most of these uh, neural networks that are being used especially commercially the multiplication happens when a like let's say the the number was like 0.1 and another number was like 0.1 well then it would go through the the lines, okay, from the circles, from the neurons to maybe another neuron, all right, um, two lines, okay, and then you know each of those lines, those synapses would have what's called a weight. A weight that's just the number that you're going to multiply the point one and the point one by, okay, or it could be point one, point two, whatever. And let's say that that represents I don't know like a small word like the word the t h e, okay. Um, just for the purposes of conversation. So then you take that point one and point two and you would multiply it by whatever is on those those lines, those synapses in this neural network, this little digital brain. And they're both going to the same neuron, all right? And then that neuron is going to add up all of the synapses coming into it. So if it's two, and let's say that it was multiplied by one just for, for ease. Point one times one is point one. Point two times one is point two. And then gets the neuron, okay, we add them together, 0.1 plus 0.2 is 0.3, right? Simple enough. Then you take that and you're going to apply what you would call an activation function. <clears throat> so there are many different types of activation functions. One of the most popular ones is what's called RELU, R-E-L-U, Rectifier Linear Unit. Sounds fancy, don't worry about it, <clears throat> but basically, to understand what it's actually doing is that the activation function will be something like, is this number that we just multiplied and added up on this neuron, is it uh, less than zero? Or is it, is it greater than zero? Okay. If it's greater than zero, cool. Output it as, you know, 0.3. In this case, it would be, yes, we would output 0.3 because it is greater than zero. But if it was negative 0.3, um, then it would output zero. Why does this work? If you were to graph this activation function, it would look something like this on like, you know, an XY axis, so it's going straight, right? And then it kind of like goes up. What this means is that in statistical terms, which is what these digital brains are, it's just better able to sort of like graph an understanding over time as it gets smarter, as it learns, in order for it to learn, I'll talk more about that in a second, we're just basically going to adjust the weights, you know, the basically the numbers that we multiply by, basically those lines that connect the neurons, we're just going to adjust those in different ways in order to get it to learn to output something that is useful, like, okay, turn left at the stop sign um, or stop when it's a red light, <clears throat> for example. 
it's really just kind of like in its own like mental space. Like it's like a vision AI model, a vi you know, a neural network that can understand vision. And it's looking at, you know, a stop sign. There might be certain specific neurons that will recognize the edges of the stop sign. Okay. And in a mathematical sense, it's like kind of like graphing, you know, what, okay, that, that edge more or less, it might recognize, you know, part of the letter, the curve of, of the S. Okay. This looks like an S, this looks like a T, O, P, and so on. So at a basic level, that is more or less, um, what is happening within a neural network. It's better to think of neural networks as just statistical prediction models. That's essentially what a neural network is. It is doing statistics. Uh, and why? How does that make sense? Well, this is how, how they actually will be able to win at games because they're just, they're making a probability prediction of what is the best possible choice or most likely choice to take within this environment based on how it's been trained. And it can be trained again. So let's answer this question next. Everything we just said begs the question, how does it actually learn? There are many different ways, um, some of which are still under research today, but like with uh, robotics and simulated robotics, like where you have like a hand that's like on a computer, it's like learning how to write because this is a common way to train AI to like, for example, move or like do a Rubik's cube in, in a hand. They might train it like in a 3D environment on a computer and then actually have it work in real life with, with an actual robotic hand, which you might have seen videos of that at some point, or just, you know, robots doing something interesting. So they, they will train kind of the robot's brain in a 3D environment that is similar and has similar physics to the real world, and then actually have it do something in the real world. But I digress. Some robotics and other AI um, brains, they use a reward-based system where it's like, okay, uh, good job, you know, plus one, or bad, you know, minus one. Um, there's also neuroevolution, which I'm a big fan of. Neuroevolution is very similar to evolution, evolution theory, in terms of how the most fit uh, individuals in a population will survive and reproduce, and those that are not fit in terms of their brain making good decisions will, you know, die off. They will not reproduce. And you go through many generations of populations of brains making random, small, random changes, aka mutations, just like in evolution theory, and the strongest survive and reproduce. And eventually, you have uh, a population or maybe one individual in a population that is able to solve the problem, play the game, whatever, perfectly. So neuroevolution neuro is very interesting. It's, um, it has some advantages too over backpropagation. It's, it's been proven uh, to be quite scalable and is the most popular today. It is used to train the large language models um, and multimodal models where they might do images, image processing, image generation, and actually uh, generating text. Again, this is the algorithm that is the most popular today. And the way that this helps AI models and neural networks to actually learn, uh, like ChatGPT is actually trained this way in Gemini and others, is they will basically um, feed in like, for example, a paragraph of text from Wikipedia, for instance, and they'll cover up the last word in that paragraph, for example. And then this AI neural network will output a prediction of, okay, what is the last word? And the last word might be rock, but instead it will output something else like the word the, and the is the wrong word, um, but, in number terms, because these words have been translated to numbers in, in, in a certain way, um, it's possible to sort of measure the difference since we know what the correct word is and we know that it just made a wrong prediction, it's possible to calculate what's called the error rate. So how far in kind of a digital space in terms of like how these words are like kind of put into a, a space. What is the distance between how close it was in terms of a prediction? Because again, space meaning like if the word the was represented by 0.1 and the word rock was represented by 0.3, there's a kind of a distance that can be measured there. Um, so then that, that error or distance using calculus and the calculus chain rule is propagated backwards. So it, hence back propagation through the neural network, a bunch of calculations. And with each calculation, the weights, AKA the synapses, the lines between the circles, which represent neurons, um, those are updated. So instead of 0.1 
And point two, like in our earlier example, it might be updated to be point one, two, one. And the other one might be updated to be point two, zero, 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 two. Um, these are typically like small changes. The paragraph might be fed in like multiple times, multiple times until the, the error rate closes and it's able to eventually predict consistently the right word. Now, what is happening uh, to train, you know, on a much larger scale is basically AI models of today are fed in like billions and billions of um, words, petabytes of, of data, basically like that example with, with a paragraph from Wikipedia, but a very wide variety of curated, you know, text. And then it just has to predict the word, predict the word, predict the word. And then with each, you know, prediction or group of predictions, backpropagation will, will occur, the weights will be updated, and gradually the predictions will become, you know, more accurate. It will, you know, more intelligent. So that when it's predicting that word going forward, it actually is able to predict not just one word at a time, but multiple words at a time. And thus, when you give it a context, like, hey, look at this chat. This text was just said by, you know, Bob. And Bob just said, I need support with this product. Um, I need you to, you know, understand how you're going to write the words that you're about to say to me. Can you, can you help me with this? And then the next and last word that the AI might see would be, you know, AI bot. Okay. And then knowing the, that previous response and the context, it's not necessarily even thinking that it is an AI bot, but it is having been statistically trained kind of like, okay, well, what would AI bot actually say since there's, it says AI bot colon. So it's going to say blah, 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 blah. And it just makes a prediction. And that in a nutshell is how AI actually works in hopefully simple and clear enough terms that you can understand clearly. And again, it's it's just simple math at a fundamental level, and it just kind of builds up from there. All right. So AI, when you hear AI and neural networks, they kind of think that they're one and the same, at least as of today. And these are just little digital brains on computers that are trained um, and function off of doing uh, lots of math in parallel and quickly. Um, it's really just addition, multiplication, and that uh, fancy word activation functions. So what do you think of this video? Did you find it valuable? Uh, please let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear uh, more content like this. I will make more content. Um, I'm qualified to speak about this because I have literally built AI from scratch myself. And at Grobo, um, we are building an AI growth automation platform for businesses with teams of AI agents that uh, businesses and, and startups can basically form themselves and put into uh, workflows to actually do work um, that otherwise them or their team would have to do that's repetitive and they can just automate it instead. And it can perform anything from creating Facebook ads, uh, you know, doing analytics, um, setting up uh, newsletters, you know, drafting, redrafting, editing, um, can help you with, uh, you know, categorizing, sifting and through sifting through job applicants, for example, um, pretty much, you know, social media posts, content calendar strategy, uh, really the sky's the limit. And, uh, you know, in the near future, we plan on integrating uh, human talent as well into the platform, since that is the productized service that we make most of our revenue as of this moment. But we're launching Grobo right now. Check it out. You can try it as of today for $1 to get early access. So check us out at grobo.com if that is of interest to you. Again, if you found this valuable, uh, please consider liking the video, leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you and consider sharing it with others who might find it valuable as well. The channel is growing thanks to support from people like you. Thank you.